Welcome to Morningstar Fellowship Online. We are so glad you've joined us for this week's message. We encourage you to come join us in person for our live worship experience every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. at either our Quakertown or Pennsburg campuses. You can head over to www.mstarqtown.org for more information. Again, thanks for listening, and here's this week's message. Well, a welcome Welcome to Good Friday at Morningstar, man. It is, uh, it is great to be here with you guys tonight. Obviously, if, uh, if you arrived here right when we were kind of getting started tonight, you could sense that it's going to be a little bit of a different type of night. Uh, the service is going to be a little bit different than a typical, a typical Sunday morning, uh, but that's intentional. Uh, this night is really just some, a time for us to really reflect on the cross of Jesus Christ and what that means for us if we're here and we're followers of Christ. What does the cross actually mean to us? And so tonight it's going to be much more of a night of worship and reflection. I'm not going to share for very long tonight, but the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 1.18. It says the, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction, but to we who are being saved, we know it's the very power of God. A Good Friday is really is a time for us to really understand what that verse means. And the Bible is very, very clear that uh, for those of us who, who may, for those that maybe do not know Christ, uh, the, the cross doesn't really make sense. Have you ever tried to explain that to somebody and they're like, that doesn't make sense. There, there had to have been a, a better way, a different way. Like none of that makes any sense at all. But the Bible says those who have experienced it, those who have ex- experienced forgiveness of their sins, those who have experienced the cross of Jesus Christ in their lives, then they understand that the cross really is the very power of God for salvation. You see, Good Friday and Easter, like you can't separate those two from one another. There would be no Easter Sunday, no resurrection Sunday without the cross of Jesus Christ. And and without the resurrection, the cross really would have been a, a, a terrible thing that Jesus would have gone through. It would have been a painful thing. It would have been a terrible situation, but it would have been no different than the thousands of other people who at that time died on a cross. It was very common. The thing that makes Good Friday so powerful, the thing that makes the cross so life-changing wasn't just the the physical reality of the crucifixion of the cross, but the spiritual reality of what was taking place on that cross that God was doing through Jesus's sacrifice. And so, as I said, tonight is going to be much more about worship, reflection. We're going to take communion together. But I want to focus in on one uh, one particular portion of scripture tonight uh, that we've talked about before. You might be familiar with it, but it's Colossians chapter 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 two, verses 13 through 15. It says this, it says you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature that was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all of our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, He disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. As we think about that verse and we think about the the cross, there's three things that I wanna kind of draw our attention to tonight. Uh, With our mindset on the cross, the first thing that we realize is this. We realize that our sin was much worse than we thought. When when you think about the cross of Jesus Christ, we, we have to understand that our sin was much worse than we think. I think a lot of times our tendency is to kind of, to kind of minimize our sin. And we do that by looking at other people's sin at times that we think are worse than ours. And, and so we have a tendency to compare ourselves to other people. Well, at least I didn't do that or I'm not as bad as that person. But the reality is we have to come face to face with the reality that our, our sin is worse than we believe. That in the Bible, in, in Colossians there, what does it say? It says our spiritual condition before Jesus Christ was one of death. He says, you weren't just a sick version of yourself. You weren't just somebody who needed a little bit of cleaning to to, to be polished up, to look good. No, you were dead in your sins, that you were spiritually dead. Dead people cannot do anything to change their condition. He's saying the reality of our state outside of the cross of Jesus Christ before Jesus worked in our lives was that we were dead in our sins. And when we look at the cross of Christ, we see really two important elements of God's nature reconciled into one. We see the, the wrath of God towards sin. And at the same time, we see the love of God towards sinners. You know, because crucifixion is not something that we see today, it's not commonplace today, it's easy for us at times, I think, to miss just how brutal of a death this was. It was one of the absolute worst ways to die. It was one of the, the most long lasting, shameful, brutal, and painful ways, typically reserved for like the worst of the worst of the worst criminals. 
In fact, it was such a bad way to die. It was such a painful way to die, such a horrible way to die that they didn't even have a word to explain it. So they had to create a word to kind of explain the pain that was involved with it. And that word was excruciating. That word, if you look at the origins of that word, the history of that word, that word literally means the overwhelmingly intense pain of the cross. Like there was nothing to explain it. How many of you have ever seen the movie, The Passion of the Christ? Anybody seen The Passion of the Christ? How many of you watched it more than once? Anybody? Like I, I've watched it once. I can remember uh, uh, years ago when that first came out, I, I was working at Morningstar in Bechtelsville and we, we rented out the movie theater in Quakertown to, to, to kind of make available for people to watch that movie. And I can remember watching that movie once. And, and man, there's parts in that movie where you just, you just want to turn away. I, I don't think there's a, a better movie that, that shows in, in the brutal detail of, of quite possibly what the extent of what Jesus went through during that crucifixion, especially during the scene. The scene that was probably the hardest for me to watch, maybe you as well, was, was during the scourging, the flogging, the, the whipping, that part of the crucifixion. The Romans had a, had a name for the whip that they would use. It was called the cat of nine tails. And essentially it was a whip that was made of, of different length strips of leather. And in the leather, they had interwoven sharp, jagged pieces of bone or rock or clay and pieces of, of lead. And there was no a, a limit to the amount of times that they could use that onto you. In fact, it was so brutal that many times people died before they were ever crucified. They died during this initial flogging, this initial beating. In fact, there was an article in 1986 in the Journal of American Medical Association, and this is what they said. They said, the Roman soldiers repeatedly struck the victims back with full force. The iron ball, and as they did that, the iron balls would cause deep contusions and the leather strips and sheep bones would cut into the skin and subcutaneous tissue. Then, as the flogging continued, the lacerations would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. When you remember, if you remember in the movie, The Passion of the Christ, by the time that was over, like Jesus's body was almost beyond recognition. It was brutal. And after this was done, it wasn't the end of the punishment. The, the soldiers continued to mock Jesus, to ridicule Jesus. They took him aside and they put a crown of thorns on his head and they pushed it down into his skull so blood poured down his face and they put a, a robe on his back on those freshly opened wounds on his back and then they bowed down and mockingly worshipped him and spat on him and hit him with sticks and when they got tired of that and they were done with all that process they ripped that robe off his back now can you can imagine those fresh wounds how that robe would have basically just stuck to it completely and then they rip that robe off and it reopens all of those wounds. Imagine ripping off a thousand band-aids at one time on freshly wounded skin. You imagine the pain and the suffering in that moment of what Jesus is going through. I believe that Jesus' body at that time would have been more, more unrecognizable, more disfigured than we can even understand. In fact, in Isaiah 52, prophetically speaking, it said, just as many were appalled at you, his appearance was so disfigured that he did not look like a man and his form did not resemble a human being. I believe that that is speaking to what Jesus was going to look like in the midst of this process. And on top of all of that, after all of that was done, he still had to face the cross. And he has to carry the cross and he's so weak at this point because of how much blood that he's lost and how dehydrated he is that he can't even carry this cross. They have to find somebody else to carry it for him. And they bring him up to this place where ultimately he was gonna lose his life, lay down his life, a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. And they lay him down on this wooden cross and they take long spikes, long nails. And either through his wrist or through his hands, they, they, they hang him on the cross. And most assuredly, it came coming into contact with one of the main nerves, the median nerve that was there. For his feet to be pierced to the cross, they would have taken his legs and kind of twisted them in a very uncomfortable and painful position, unnatural position, and nailed his feet to the cross as well. And then they would take this cross and they would lift it up and they would just let it drop into the hole. Can you imagine the amount of pain that you would feel at that moment as your entire body, the weight of everything, hitting all of those nerves, the tissue on your back ripped open, all of that one jartling fall into this pit. And typically this could last for hours and sometimes even days on the cross. It was meant to last as long as possible. They would, they would be there suffocating and, and asphyxiation on their own blood. And typically if the Romans wanted to end this a little bit early, what they would do is they would break their, the, the person's legs, 
so they could no longer push up because what they would have to do to get breath is they would have to push themselves up, lean all their weight on that nerve, pressing on that nerve, pressing on the nerves in their feet, pushing themselves up so they could get a, a gasp of breath until they had no energy left to do it. The Bible says that, that the criminals next to Jesus, they had their legs broken, but Jesus, when they came and they were about to break his legs, he was already dead. So what they took was a spear and they put it up under his rib cage into his heart. And the Bible says that blood and water poured out from him. Well, you say, why, why, are we, why are we going into so much detail? Why are we, we talking about the, the, the gruesome details of what Jesus, I don't even think the words that we speak can even do it justice. And the reason I think we need to, to look at it like that is because when we look at the brutality of the cross, we look at the punishment that Jesus endured, we understand that that, that is what our sin deserves. That's the picture we should be seeing. The punishment is our punishment. The, the torture and pain and, and separation that Jesus felt in that moment was the torture, pain, and separation that you and I are meant to experience because of our sin. When you look at the cross, what we should see is, is God's wrath towards our sin. That's the, the bad news. But at the same time, the, the good news that we see, the beauty of the cross is not only do we see the wrath of God, but we also see the love and mercy of God because instead of that wrath being poured out on us, us paying the, the own price for our own sins, the punishment for our own sins, the separation from God for our own sins. Jesus willingly put himself in our place. He willingly took the punishment, the wrath of God towards us. We've talked about this throughout our series in Romans, if you've been here, this idea of propitiation, that Jesus is that payment that satisfied, that he turned aside the wrath of God. This is what is taking place on, on the cross. He's not just making God forget his wrath. He is actually paying for the wrath. He's satisfying the wrath of God towards our sin, not his own sins, but our sins. Isaiah 53, it says it like this. It says, he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. First Peter, it says it like this in chapter two, verse 24, it says, he himself bore our sins in his body on that tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. It's by his wounds that you have been healed. Like we can't, we can't minimize this. We can't turn our eyes away from the cross. We need to focus in. We need to allow ourselves to feel the weight of the, of the brutality of the cross. And when we do feel the weight of it, we need to remind ourselves the reason it was so brutal is because of our sin. That was our sin. That was our punishment that he took on himself. The second thing we see when we think about the cross is this, is that our sin debt was satisfied in Christ. I love that part of the verse is though we were dead in our sins, Christ made us alive by forgiving us. He canceled the record of the charges against us by nailing them to the cross. Now, typically when, when somebody was crucified, they would put a, a sign on the cross and that sign would tell the charges that were against the person that was dying. It was meant to be a, a, a written warning to everybody who passed by, everybody who watched and saw that person on the cross. What did they do? As a reminder, hey, do not do the crimes that they did or you're gonna receive the same punishment that you see them receiving. And Jesus didn't break any laws. He didn't do anything wrong. And so the only charge they could put against him was they wrote, he said he was the, the king of the Jews. He claimed to be the king of the Jews. But I want us to understand that, that the idea we're seeing here is this, and we've talked about this before, that all of us, we carry around a, a written record, so to speak, of our wrongs, of our sins. Can you imagine? Just think about your entire life. Can you imagine if you had a, a written record, a spiritual IOU of, of what you owe back to God because of your sins that you carried around with you? And on that thing was listed all of your sins from the time you were born to your current time. Every single thing you did wrong, every single wrong thought you had, every single wrong motive of the heart that looked good on the outside, but God knew the motive of your heart. Can you imagine how long? Some of us would have a book Right? Some of us would have a series of novels that we'd be carrying around with us, our written record of wrong. We have a, a bill, a debt that we can live a thousand lifetimes that we could not pay off. And that's what the beautiful part of the cross is saying. It says what Jesus did on the cross is he canceled that debt. He took that, that written record of our sins and he said, it is void, right? He took it and he nailed it to the cross and went on that cross instead of just his sign that said, he said he was 
the king of the Jews. Every single one of us who's put our faith in Jesus Christ on that cross was our record of wrongs, your record of sin, your name with everything that you've done wrong, every sin, past, present, and future. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ was on that cross with him. And when his blood was shed and when his blood was poured out, it was poured out for your sins. It was poured out as payment for your wrongs. The Bible says it was nailed to the cross with Jesus. And this in and of itself is, is so amazing. The fact that Jesus did for us what we can never do for ourselves. The fact that in one moment, he paid the price that we could spend a thousand lifetimes trying to pay through empty religion. It's amazing. But what's even more amazing than that is that he didn't stop there. The final thing we see is that at the cross, not only is our sin debt satisfied, but that because of the cross, because of what Jesus did, we can walk in victorious freedom. I love that last verse. It says, in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. You see, Satan was looking at the cross and he thought he won. Satan looked at the cross and he believed that he had the victory. The devil and the demons though, they didn't realize that this was all part of God's plan. They didn't realize that not even death could hold Jesus down. That this was the very reason that it had come. They thought they were putting an end to God's kingdom and God's power. But on that cross, Christ was putting an end to their rule. I, I don't typically read from the Message Bible when we preach, but I love how the Message Bible puts verse 15. It says, he stripped all of the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority. And at the cross, he marched them naked through the streets. Like I love the, 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 the picture that's painted white because it's the picture we've talked about this before. That, that when, when a king would conquer another nation, when they would have victory over another king, what they would typically do if that king was still alive is they would strip that king of their royal robe. They would tie them up and they would pull them behind the parade as a public spectacle, a public mocking, a public shaming, a public show of power that they were defeated. And what, what he's saying here in Colossians is that on the cross, that's exactly what Jesus did. The cross was God displaying his power over the enemy. And listen, if you're in Christ, if your faith is put in Christ, listen, if that is the reality of your life, then Satan has no power in your life either. That at the, at the cross, he was once and for all time disarmed, disgraced, and defeated, and you can walk in victorious freedom. Now listen, that doesn't mean he's not gonna try. Listen, his end result is known. Doesn't mean he's not gonna go, it doesn't mean he's gonna try, he's gonna go down swinging, right? How many of you have experienced that? He, he's kicking and screaming, he's gonna do everything possible. The Bible says he's come to steal, kill, and destroy, which means he's gonna do everything possible to try to steal, kill, and destroy in your life. He's gonna accuse and condemn us. He's gonna try to tempt us to sin, to fall short of what God has for us. But every time he does, we can remind him when we look at the cross, that on the cross, not only was our debt paid, but he was disarmed and defeated, and victory is ours in Christ Jesus. Listen, this is, this is what makes Good Friday so good. Like this is why we, we have this day. This is why we celebrate this day because death was defeated and life is ours, not because of anything we've done, but because of what Christ has done for us. Would you stand with me as we, as we prepare to go back into worship tonight? As I said, tonight we're gonna, we're gonna do something a little bit different. We're going to take communion and, and uh, we, we have a couple different kind of like prayer and response stations set up tonight. You look over here, you probably saw that when you were coming in, there's a cross over here and the communion station is, is over here. What I want us to do tonight, we, we talked about how when we're in Christ, all of our sin and the, the charges against us have been nailed to the cross. But the reality is, is that even though that is the, re, the spiritual truth of our life in Christ, Many of us, we still struggle. We still struggle to walk in the victory that is, is ours. And so what I want us to do tonight, maybe you know that area of struggle in your life. I'm gonna have you take a step of faith tonight and actually as a sign to yourself, I want you to deal with it. I want you to, to take that. There's paper over there, pens over there. I want you to, to write it down and I want you to nail it to the cross. 
And I want you to remind yourself every time you think of that, every time you're tempted to pick that back up, I want you to remind yourself that if you are in Christ, that very thing has been nailed to the cross. You left that at the cross. It's been paid for and victory is yours in Christ Jesus. Now this could look like a lot of different things. There's some of us that we know we're forgiven in Christ, but there's things that we've done in our past that, that still kind of define us. Like, like we know Christ has forgiven us, but, but we struggle to forgive ourselves. We hold on to things and, and, we, and, we, and we just kind of continue to remind ourselves and try to remind Jesus of them. How can you love me? Remember how I did this? And, and we struggle to let go. Some of you tonight, for the very last time, you need, to, you need to let that at the cross. Remember we talked about last week, he's forgiven us as far as the East is from the West. He's not constantly bringing up that sin. It has been paid for and nailed to the cross to so leave it at the cross. For some of us, it maybe is not something that we've done. Maybe it's something that's been done to us. Oftentimes the, the things that define us is not things that we've done, but things that we've experienced that, have, that, that we've allowed to kind of define our lives, define our choices. You understand when Jesus died on that cross, he did not die just for the sins that you've committed. He also died for the sins that have been committed against you so that you can walk in freedom, so that you don't have to be defined by shame. He bore your shame so you don't have to. So some of you need to nail that. Maybe it's unforgiveness or bitterness towards somebody. And you, at the same time, you need to let that go. Maybe it's just yourself. Maybe you're here tonight and you don't even know Christ. And as an act of surrender tonight, you just go up there and you just write, I give myself, put it on the cross. I'm just gonna encourage you to prayerfully consider what, what you may be holding on to. And as an act of worship, as a, an act of surrender, would you deal with it tonight? And would you begin to walk in freedom and victory because it is yours in Christ Jesus? You never, ever, 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 ever again have to walk as a slave to something that you have been freed from. And then if, if you do that, or if you, even if you don't do that, we're also gonna have time to take communion. Now, we're not gonna lead through communion like a normal Sunday morning. There's some scripture verses on the table. You can take one. I'm gonna just encourage you to, to grab your, your communion and whether it's with your family that you came with tonight or maybe some of your brothers and sisters in the Lord or maybe just by yourself as, as just a time of worship and reflection, read through those scripture verses, remind yourself of what Christ has done for you, what communion means, why we take that, why we have been brought into this new covenant through Christ. And then we're gonna just continue to worship and close out this night with worship. And so I'm gonna pray. You're gonna see a video on the screen with the worship song. Worship team's gonna come back up and we're gonna go through the night. But listen, right away when we're, when we're done praying, that music comes on. Take that step. Whatever step that is tonight, take the step. Let's begin to worship it that way. Father, tonight, we're so grateful for the cross. We're so grateful for these moments where we can just reflect. We can reflect on the brutality of the cross, even though we may not fully understand it. But God, we're so grateful for what you did for us on the cross. Lord, that you took the, the full brunt of God's wrath towards my sin, towards every single person's sin in this room that is that has put their faith in you. You took it all. You paid the price. Your word says that you became sin who knew no sin so that we could be right with God. God, I pray for those who are still struggling, dealing with things, holding on to things that you have freed them from. Maybe it's an addiction, a struggle with sin that they feel like they can't get through, they can't get over, yet you have freed them from that. God, would you allow them to deal, deal with it tonight? Do the work to, to put it on that cross, to surrender it, to leave it there, God. Let us never walk in slavery to something that you have freed us from. Your word says that we are no longer slaves to sin, but we are servants to righteousness. Lord, we're so thankful for this time of, of receiving communion and worshiping you and remembering your sacrifice with eyes of expectation, looking ahead to Easter Sunday. We give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen.